welcome uh, everyone to the last uh, ITC lunch of the spring uh, semester. Uh, as you can tell, spring is here. And uh, uh, we just uh, heard an excellent uh, talk by Mike Klein, uh, who is sitting over there. And uh, we learned a lot about what we should believe on planet atmosphere and what we should not. Um, and he will speak uh, in a little while. Um, you also may have heard about uh, the interesting LIGO detections uh, last week, and uh, we're still monitoring. There is no electromagnetic counterpart uh, as of yet, uh, simply because the region of the sky that was identified was quite broad. Uh, there was a neutron star, neutron star merger on Thursday, and then unclear either neutron star, neutron star, neutron star, black hole merger on Friday last week. So. Now that the events occur once per week, uh, <laughs> perhaps uh, they will not be as, uh, uh, how should I say, um, well, they might be exciting if they are different than we expected, but if they keep being black holes or, or neutron stars at some point, uh, we will accept them as uh, improvement in the statistics of what we know. But uh, we should see. Uh, we have a very uh, busy schedule today because uh, uh, we also include the, the recipients of the Eric uh, Kito Prize uh, this year. And by the way, Eric Kito is sitting there. He's a real person. <laughs> <laughs> donated the funds for this uh, award that we give once a year for the best PhD thesis. And when we have a hard, in theoretical astrophysics, when we have a hard time, we give it to two people. And uh, that's what uh, happened this year. Uh, we gave it to uh, Levan Garrison from the Astronomy Department. Uh, and to Andrew Shell from the physics department. Uh, as, and we will have both of them speak uh, as a combined first speaker. Uh, so we will not have questions in between the two talks, but maybe after, um, because we have five speakers today. Um, Liman uh, Garrison will speak about the uh, Abacos, the next generation of n body cosmology. So he will speak about. Um, the, the biggest scales that, that we can imagine. Uh, and then Andrew Shell will speak about the uh, radiative magnetically arrested disk simulations of the supermassive black hole in M87. And as many of you know, uh, Andrew was uh, significantly responsible for the beautiful image that many of us saw on the front pages of the newspapers. So he will tell us a little bit of what he did during this history in making this happen. And then um, we'll hear from Steve Finkenstein, that, uh, where is Steve? Oh, here he is. Uh, visiting us from UT Austin, uh, he will uh, give the CFA colloquium today, and here he will talk about the start of head decks, head decks uh, the Hobby Everly Telescope Dark Energy Experiment. Uh, after that, we'll hear again from Mike Line, uh, ASU. He will talk about round dwarf abundances. And we'll uh, conclude with uh, Ping Yuan uh, visiting us from Pasi in uh, South Korea. Uh, and we'll talk about the discovery of a new destruction mechanism for cosmic dust and its implications in astrophysics. Lima. Okay, uh, thank you, Avi. Uh, I'd like to tell you today about what I've been working on for the past six years uh, during my PhD thesis with Daniel Eisenstein. I've mostly worked on this cosmological embody code uh, that we call. Uh, abacus. So first, to, to orient everybody, um, so what are cosmological embodied simulations? Well, as the, the name suggests, we're uh, taking a sampling of the initial cosmological density field with n particles, uh, and we have an analytic predictive theory for what this initial density field looks like, but our analytic predictions go no further than uh, relatively high redshift. So if we want to actually predict what telescopes will see in galaxy surveys, then we need to predict the rich structural formation that happens towards lower redshift. Um, so on the right-hand side here, I've put a, a nice picture of an output of an abacus simulation showing the cosmic web over hundreds of megaparsecs. Uh, and there's a rich structure of, of halos. There's a zoom-in of one here connected by, by filaments and voids. Uh, and we want to use these simulations to test whether our cosmological parameter inference from galaxy surveys is um, precise 
and unbiased. In the presence of complicated systematics, uh, such as redshift space distortions, uh, tracer bias, um, and we want to be able to extend these analyses to higher order correlations and non lambda CDM cosmologies where um, analytic theory is not keeping pace with observations. So, uh, and we, we want these simulations to be uh, very large as well, uh, usually several times larger than the cosmological volume that your survey is probing because you want to know exactly how precise the analysis of your survey is. If your simulation volume is only as large as your survey volume, then you are doomed to declare your survey systematics limited, even if the truth is better than that. So our attempt at uh, making a code for embodied simulations is called Abacus, and it's based on a new mathematical method for splitting the near field and far field force. And I'll talk about the, what that means on the next few slides. Um, the result, though, is that we don't actually need supercomputer allocations to run cosmological embody simulations. Uh, we can use one node with enough disk to hold all of the, the particles. Uh, the raw computational power is provided by GPUs. Um, and so the method is fast, but it's also accurate. The uh, median fractional error on the forces in Abacus is about 10 to the minus 5 compared to the few percent level errors um, common in mesh-based codes. Um, the development team for Abacus is, is still pretty small, but um, so it's not as mature a code as, as other well-known codes like Gadget, but we're working on deploying a parallel implementation for, for really massive sims on the Summit supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Lab, which is currently the, the number one computer supercomputer in the world. Um, so we're um, so lots of feature development ongoing for on-the-fly analysis and improvements in, in areas like time-stepping, and uh, Nina Maximova is, is leading a lot of this development. Uh, so I mentioned the near-field, far-field split, so let me explain in a few slides what I mean by that. Um, so the Abacus domain decomposition is a simple cubic mesh, which I'm just showing a 2D slice of here, where we take all the particles in the simulation uh, and assign every particle to a cell. And now we're going to ask the question, what is the force on uh, this green particle in the center cell here? Uh, we're going to split the, the force contributions on this particle into two components, the, uh, the near field component and a far field component. The near field is, is shown in black here. That's every cell that's uh, directly adjacent to the center cell. And the far field is shown in gray here. The red particle is part of the, the far field. Um, so in, um, so th this idea of, of splitting a force into a near field and far field component is not new to Abacus. Uh, this is common in um, mesh codes or, or uh, PQ dem codes, as they're called, particle, particle, particle mesh, uh, and the, uh, in which you take all of your mass in the simulation, bin it up onto a mesh, looks something like this, solve Poisson's equation uh, using Fourier transforms on the mesh, and then interpolate the force from the mesh back to the particle. So, but your force isn't going to be very accurate on sub-cell scales, so you want to refine that force with direct pairwise interactions. Um, so, but then a problem arises. You've assigned all the mass in the simulation onto this mesh, so the mesh includes all, uh, all contributions. So if you, if you then want to do a direct pairwise interaction to refine the force, you're double counting particles. This is shown schematically on the right-hand side here where this uh, solid line is the one on R squared Newtonian gravity force kernel that you want to compute. And this dashed line labeled far field is shown to, um, to give a contribution even at small separations. So if you were to compute uh, this one on R squared line in the, the near field, then you would, uh, you, would be over, you would be double counting and overshoot the one on R squared force. So you have to uh, do something called Green's function matching to compute this compensated kernel, which is this um, other dashed line in the near field. Uh, so you can do this, um, but this is um, relatively inaccurate and, and slow. This compensated form is much more complicated than one on R squared. So um, I will hurry up. Um, <laughs> the, so in Abacus, we achieve an exact decomposition of the near field and far field. And that looks uh, something like this. Um, it's based on the mathematical method of Mechnik 2009, um, and uh, but essentially we're 
we're able to compute exactly one on R squared in the near field and in the far field. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a compact separation of the, the, the force kernel. Uh, this is really nice because this is really fast to compute on GPUs, and we can compute the far field with a multipole method, which I will perhaps skip through right now. Um, so tomorrow I'm going to tell you all about my thesis and all the, the wonderful things I've done with Abacus uh, and why my committee should let me pass. But today I'm going to tell you why they should think twice. <laughs> uh, so, so we've learned a lot of lessons about how not to write an embody code, what things you can do wrong. Um, and I will uh, flip through a few of them quickly. Uh, so one memorable uh, incident was a time in which I, I uh, wanted to launch a, a suite of 20 simulations with Abacus um, with a different initial phases, and I thought I had set it up correctly, and I hit go, and then I, I checked the results, and I realized that I had run 20 identical simulations. <laughs> um, so that was, that was embarrassing, but actually there was, um, but something good came out of this actually, because we were able to uh, ask how reproducible are the results of Abacus. <laughs> Um, and it's actually not so bad. Um, the, the maximum error on a given particle is, is uh, about one megaparsec. So this would typically happen if a particle, a chaotic particle orbit, um, ends up on one side of a halo versus another. But um, the 99.9th percentile is only one kiloparsec difference. And that's, uh, that's way smaller than the softening length. So we we're actually pretty pleased with this result. Um, Let's see. I will tell you about this as well. Uh, so, um, we, so Abacus is a, a very performance intensive code and it's doing a lot of memory allocations um, to the point where, um, so uh, to the point where we're putting a tremendous amount of pressure on the operating system to feed us memory at a high rate. Um, so this chart here is just showing the number of allocations versus size. So we're doing we're mixing a tremendous range of allocations from uh, a few bytes to to several gigabytes in a given simulation, uh, and uh, it got to the point where literally just releasing memory back to the operating system was taking 10% of the total simulation time. And you would think that this would be a, a free operation, a, a gimme, but uh, it was it was not. And and it took us a while to actually notice what was going on here. Um, so we uh, swapped out our, the operating system's uh, memory allocator for Google's TC malloc, thread cache malloc, um, and it instantly made Abacus 60% faster, which was uh, pretty shocking because we run these simulations for weeks, so now we're running them in days. Um, and uh, yes, so it took it took me a long time to realize that something was up, uh, which it, so we spent a lot more time running some simulations than we should have been. Uh, but Abacus is now faster as a result. Um, so I don't think I have time to tell you about anything else. So uh, if you would like to hear more, please come to my thesis talk tomorrow. Um, just as an advertisement, I'll, I'll say that we, we're, Abacus is, is about an order of magnitude faster than, than other GPU embody codes um, and is, is simultaneously orders of magnitude more accurate. Um, and I think one of the lessons of my PhD has been that software engineering really matters. So I was able to double the speed of Abacus with no algorithmic changes, just with being smarter and paying more attention to software engineering. So thank you. <laughs> Move on to Andrew's. Great. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, work I did with Ramesh Narayan, advised by Ramesh Narayan, at radiative two temperature simulations of supermassive black hole in M87. This is work I did in the context of the Event Horizon Telescope Project, who were also all my advisors for the most part. Um, so 
people have been making images and observing the supermassive black hole jet in M87 for about the last century. Uh, over the last few decades, we've gone closer and closer in, higher and higher frequency VLBI observations into the core following the jet along. Um, and now, in the last month, the Event Horizon Telescope has released the first image of the central engine of this jet, um, the supermassive black hole shadow. It's a few sizes the time of our, uh, few times the size of our solar system. And so, while this is a talk about theoretical simulations, I just want to say that um, field by imaging has also been very important to me over the course of my thesis. I've sort of done both work on simulations and imaging and designed new imaging algorithms. And so, um, one of the things I'm particularly interested in um, in this project on simulations is how do we use images from VLBI, from EHT, and um, at longer wavelengths to interpret and constrain um, these simulations of M87. So, our best sort of theoretical tools for understanding these uh, supermassive black hole accretion flows are general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations. But in directly applying these to interpret um, observed quantities like images, spectra, and light curves, we have an issue, which is that GRMHD simulations usually only involve a single fluid. Um, and this fluid is dominated by the inertia of the ions, um, whereas it's the electrons that radiate. And um, because the uh, densities and temperatures in these systems are so high, the electrons and ions are not generally in thermodynamic equilibrium with each other. Um, so typically what is done is the electron to ion temperature ratio will be set throughout the simulation manually in post-processing. This introduces a substantial amount of new degree of freedom, and um, we ask the question, can we try to understand the electron temperature distribution um, from first principles from the underlying physics? Um, so, we ran, run these now two temperature GRMHD simulations implemented in uh, the code Coral, which was developed originally by Oleg Sadowski, who used to be a postdoc here. Um, and these uh, add additional quantities, as well as radiation to GRMHD, um, representing the entropy of um, the electrons and ions. And they're evolved by the, uh, the first law of thermodynamics with um, interactions um, where, energy, where the electrons lose energy to radiation, and both are um, gain energy through uh, turbulent dissipation. And this turbulent dissipation represents sort of the biggest source of uncertainty um, in our understanding of the physics, because we don't really know what the microphysical plasma processes that um, pump energy into, into these two species are. So while we can identify the total dissipation in a simulation numerically by tracking these two species adiabatically, um, we need some sort of subgrid prescription to tell us what fraction of this energy goes into the electrons versus, um, versus the ions. And so just very briefly, I'll, we um, explored two of these subgroup prescriptions um, in my work. Um, so one was this turbulent heating prescription um, where the turbulent cascade is truncated by Landau damping um, that has been used in all the previous work on, on this su subject. And this has a characteristic behavior where it predominantly heats electrons to extremely high temperatures when the magnetic pressure is high, and uh, vice versa, it gives very little energy to electrons when the magnetic pressure is low. Um, so we compared this to a, a new uh, prescription for um, this delta E factor representing how um, efficient electron heating is um, based on simulations of magnetic reconnection with the idea that it's now magnetic reconnection truncating the turbulent cascade. Um, and this has a much smoother behavior and doesn't have to show this sharp bifurcation. Um, so turning now to M87, previous work um, simulating M87 with GRMHD has all more or less used weak magnetic flux, so the same mode of accretion. Um, and these simulations have been able to match EHD observations and the spectrum around 230 gigahertz quite well, um, but they generally produce large-scale jets that are too weak and too narrow. Um, so we decided to turn instead uh, to the magnetically erected disk case. What happens if we pump up the magnetic field um, accumulating on the black hole? So we ran two simulations, both at high values of black hole spin, um, testing both this turbulent cascade and magnetic reconnection heating prescription. Um, and scaled them to match the EHT's observed flux density in um, 2009 to 2012. Actually, it's fallen since then, so we should go back and do that again. Um, so what we found is that when you pump up the magnetic field and put the disk into the mad state, we produce um, large-scale jets that go um, down to longer, that dominate the image at longer wavelengths um, that are both wide and powerful. Um, and be, whereas typically you're, um, the simulations are unable to match the spectrum of M87 down um, much past the, the millimeter peak, we are able to get good agreement with the observed spectrum down to centimeter wavelengths. Um, however, above the um, 2, 3 gigahertz peak, uh, the, the spectrum is dominated by probably very, very energetic processes right near the horizon, which you might need to incorporate in future simulations, like non-thermal electrons. Um, but both of the images look 
somewhat similar at the large scales, we found actually quite a different, large difference in jet power depending on what heating prescription is used. Um, the reconnection heating produces a jet power which is right in line in the measured range, whereas the um, turbulent heating model produces one that's slightly too small. And digging into the simulation, we actually found this is because radiative feedback was incredibly important in the case where we were using the old turbulent heating prescription. Um, this produced a very, very hot jet electrons right at the base, which pushed a ton of energy into electrons and sapped the jet of power um, that it would have otherwise used to accelerate. Um, comparing to VLBI images at uh, 43 gigahertz, we see that when we sort of p compare them at the same resolution as images from the VLBA, we get good agreement with the large scale um, opening angle uh, that we see in M87. And we also see good agreement with the core shift, um, this effect where the core moves down the jet um, at higher and higher frequencies until it um, is aligned with the supermassive black hole where we see it with the HT. So finally, um, going now to the, to the submillimeter um, and the EHT image, we um, see when we, in both simulations, that the jet becomes optically thin at these wavelengths. We see beautiful black hole shadows, which when you compare to the EHT images, um, look, I think, strikingly similar. Um, so just finally, I think going forward, now with the EHT, we have this incredible new um, source of information to test and directly compare simulations to observation. Um, and so it's sort of an overall advertisement for my thesis and my work over the last five years is that um, I've been able, one of the things I've been trying to do is to run simulations all the way basically from the physics through EHT imaging pipeline um, and produce um, basically exactly trying to match what um, images we would observe with the EHT if we were to observe directly these simulations. Um, so um, going forward, I'm hoping that the EHT will be providing more and more information that we can use to constrain these models, particularly time variability, um, where we may be able to track things like magnetic fields moving around the shadow um, and see how this system evolves over the next few years. Um, so there are my takeaways, and thank you. We have time for a few questions, uh, but before we, uh, Andrew, I wanted to ask, so the image that you showed us uh, was produced before you actually knew what it looks like, right? Um, um, the one... This yeah. one, no. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> <up. Okay. laughs> This is the best fitting snapshot in okay. my simulation. <laughs> and, um. and, you know, one, one of the fundamental questions about jets is whether they are made of electron-positron pairs or, yeah. or electron-protons. So do you get any difference? Can you tell what the jet is made of? Yeah, so one thing I really want to explore in my postdoc is electron-positron um, jets. These are all, um, these jets images are all dominated by sort of the jet sheath, um, which is full of electron-proton plasma. Um, okay. So there's no, we sort of, cut out the interior of the jet in the highest magnetization region so we don't assume anything about the uh, particles there. Okay, questions? Yes, go ahead. Would it be straightforward to partition the simulation into regions where the turbulent heating would be <coughs> dominated and then uh, where the convection will be dominated based on AGN physics, of the partition and uh, this turbulence, et cetera? Yeah, so I think I guess the question is basically, can we go beyond just applying one of these prescriptions everywhere in the simulation? I think that's a really interesting avenue to explore. Um, I don't really think we have to have more conversations with um, people developing these prescriptions in the plasma physics end to see what are the other conditions in the simulation that we can use to identify where, where one heating mechanism might be operative. Um, what about shocks? Are they negligible compared to turbulence and reconnection? Um, I think that's a good question. We, we don't see any like powerful shocks in, in these simulations, but um, I guess you could imagine them operating at, at smaller scales. Um, I think adding an additional mechanism, to, an additional prescription to test heating from shocks would be a great For mesh? Question for yes. that one. So, one of your slides you had this mysterious thing, AVX512. Yes. Do you have some special insights into how to use those? So, it, right, AVX is a, is a, um, a vector, um, right, vector yeah. processing method where you can do operations on, on a multiple uh, floating point variables at once. Um, AVX, I think you can do uh, eight um, floats at once, and AVX 512 is 16. Um, unfortunately, one of the lessons is that, is that uh, just doubling your vector width does not immediately result in double processing speed. Um, in Abacus, we were able to get a 30% boost by, by manually implementing AVX 512 versus AVX. Um, that's, I think that's pretty good. I mean, the processors actually down clock a bit when you start running AVX 512, so it's really, it's really a soft win. But um, 
but it's it's fun to to try to fiddle with it for maximum performance. And you are doing a single precision number, is that right? Uh, mostly, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, we have tried double precision with ABH pipe, but mm -hmm. I haven't seen a huge difference. So <laughs> probably we need to go and get our code better. Yeah, I don't know if you're ever going to see a factor of two speed up over ABX, yeah. but we'll get some get some. <coughs> Exactly. So, Lehman, the good news is you only have three orders of magnitude to go before you have a particle for each galaxy in the observable universe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'll be my, my postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the two wonderful presentations. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about something completely different. <laughs> Actually, this afternoon, I'm going to talk about something completely different again. I'm going to talk about reionization. Um, but for these next 10 minutes, I just wanted to introduce to you uh, HETDEX, the Hobby Eberly Telescope Dark Energy Experiment. And I'll finish by telling you how actually I'm hoping to use data from this to help us um, in the epoch of reionization. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do is actually introduce you to a bit of uh, history and geography and show you actually where this uh, is taking place. This is taking place at the McDonald Observatory. Uh, McDonald Observatory is in West Texas. I'll show you a map in a minute, because West Texas is very large. As you can see, we have, well, Texas in general is very large, but West Texas is still very large. Uh, there are a number of telescopes in the observatory, actually a number of small telescopes, including three big ones, a 2.1 meter and a 2.7 meter in the foreground. And then in the background, this is the Hobby Eberly Telescope. Does anybody know the diameter of the mirror on the Hobby Eberly Telescope? It's 10 meters, yeah. Uh, when I was, I was like a senior graduate student when I learned that Texas had a 10 meter telescope and I was shocked. How could I have not heard of this 10 meter telescope? And that's because it's weird. Um, <laughs> I'll explain to you how it's weird in a minute. So there it is um, in the background. So here it is geographically. So this is how far out you have to zoom on Google Maps to get Boston and <laughs> McDonald Observatory on the same map. Here's Austin right there. We'll zoom in just a bit. Here's the observatory, here's Austin. Here's Tucson, so I was just in Tucson last month, and uh, Tucson's a nice uh, reference point because the observatory is about halfway between Tucson and Austin. Zoom in again, and you can learn that Texas actually has mountains. It's probably not in your picture of Texas. Most people think of Texas as very flat. Actually, Austin, if you haven't been there, is quite beautiful. It's hilly, it's green. Um, a lot of Texas is fairly flat and ugly, uh, including <laughs> everywhere around the Davis Mountains, but here there are Davis Mountains. These are the Davis Mountains. Zoom in some more. And we can see the observatory, and you can see it actually looks pretty green. So I sort of grew up going to observatories in Arizona where it's kind of brown and desert-like. Uh, McDonald Observatory is pretty green, so it's very beautiful. Um, and you kind of don't even realize you're on a mountain because the road that you kind of approach these mountains on, you're only a few hundred feet below the actual peak of the mountain. So we have a nice visitor center there. Uh, Big Bend National Park is about 100 miles south of here, and so that helps us uh, with a lot of visitors because otherwise you're three hours from El Paso, which is many more hours from maybe somewhere else you would like to be. So, um, but over, I observed once at spring break, and they have thousands of people per day coming by to get towards the telescope. So here are where the smaller telescopes are. Here's where Javier Lee is. This is about a mile. You can run it. Uh, I did that once. It was not fun. It's a big, big elevation change. So here's the Javier Eberle uh, in all its glory with its dome open right there. We can look inside the dome. And it kind of looks like the Keck, also a 10 meter telescope. Maybe more people have heard of. It's a segmented, uh, uh, it's made up of hexagonal segments, uh, actually a little over 10 meters from end to end. The reason why you may not have heard of it as much is because we built it on the cheap. And I say we, I wasn't there then. But the cost of this telescope was about 10% of the cost of Keck, on the order of like $10 million. And the reason why that was is it doesn't move in elevation. It's at fixed elevation. Uh, and it can move in azimuth. It can move around like this, but not while it's observing. So it has a very rough azimuthal <laughs> tracking drive. So when you observe it, literally just parks there. Okay, And the way you observe things is with the secondary assembly, which actually rides on the top of the telescope, this whole thing actually moves. And it moves as an object moves across the mirror. So the secondary assembly moves and tracks the reflection of an object off the primary mirror. So all the instruments are at prime focus. Again, this is cheap. That's why you do this. But there are some limitations. Um, first of all, 
If you want to take advantage of the full aperture, you can only observe for usually at most one hour per object. So you park the telescope where it should be, and then you observe while the object is tracking across the mirror. If you try to extend that observation time, then you're basically reducing the size of your effective aperture. So I once upon a time heard someone refer to the HET as the world's largest four meter telescope. That's only if you're not using it, right? If you're using it right, you can get on average eight to nine meters of, of uh, effective collecting area. But again, you're limited to an hour or so per night. So I came there and I'm like, oh, I want to use this to stare at high redshift galaxies for 20 hours. And they said, we can't really do that. Um, you can try and stack NADA for multiple nights. It's challenging. We're, we're trying to make it happen. Um, so why not just make a big survey where at any given time, there's always something you can do for an hour. And so they eventually realized this was a smart thing to do. And that's how Hetex was born. And so this is the Hobby Eberly with the dome now cut away. Here's the mirror here. These racks on, sitting on the side, riding on the side of the telescope, those are spectrographs. And there are actually 156 spectrographs in those racks. Um, right now, there are about 100, and we're installing them at about uh, a pair every two weeks or so. And you can see there are these green alien-looking things going from the racks to the top of the telescope. These are fibers being fed by a prime focus instrument here, and those fibers are going down to these spectrographs. And so all of this together is an instrument called VIRUS, which is another acronym, which stands for Visible Integral Field Replicable Unit Spectrograph. That is the instrument that HETEX will use to do its survey. And so let's talk a bit about what HETEX is. So HETEX, again, Hobby Eberly Telescope Dark Energy Experiment. I think that's the last acronym. Oh, no, there's one more, sorry. I'll give you in a minute. Uh, it's a blind spectroscopic survey on the HET. So that means we're just looking at a big region of the sky with no preselection using VIRUS, this other acronym. The VIRUS instrument itself is 156 spectrographs at fairly low resolution, R of 750, covering a fairly narrow range, so the very blue end of the spectrum. Um, there are many, let's say, less good things about McDonald's Observatory. One of the excellent things about McDonald's, Observ McDonald's Observatory is the uh, night sky. It's the darkest place in the continental US, and so blue light imaging or spectroscopy there is fabulous, and so that's an advantage here. Um, these spectrographs, every pair of spectrographs feeds one IFU, so we have 78 IFUs and they cover about one-fifth of the focal plane, which is 22 arc minutes in diameter. So I'll show you an image of that in a second. The survey itself is 450 square degrees over four years. Each observation takes about 20 minutes. And again, that one-fifth filling factor we're actually leaving in there because for the cosmology, we don't care about that so much. So that gives you sort of 90 square degrees of sky once you take out that filling factor, uh, which from end to end covers about nine cubic gigaparsecs in volume, or if you only care about the volume of spectra, it's about two cubic gigaparsecs at this redshift range, 1.9 to 3.5. And that redshift range corresponds to where you'll get Lyman alpha across this wavelength range. And so we expect down to our emission line flux limit, which is four times 10 to the minus 17 in CGS units, about one million galaxies from Lyman alpha emission. Um, I, did my I got my PhD in 2008 uh, on a sample of 14 Lyman alpha emitters. And in 2009, I went to a AAS and I saw a poster uh, talking about HETEX and they said they'd get a million. I just kind of laughed and walked away. Thought it was ridiculous, but we actually will. Uh, we have, we have uh, over 100,000 on disk already. So a million Lyman alpha emitters, one million oxygen two emitters, if you like the low redshift universe where maybe you can learn a little bit more, uh, hundreds of thousands of stars, tens of thousands of AGN. We've already found an asteroid, all kinds of weird stuff. Um, all for about $42 million. That's the total cost of the build with a contribution from the NSF of about $8 million, uh, lots from the universities and lots of private fundraising as well. All right, so here's our telescope again. Let's zoom in on the top end. This is what the prime focus of the telescope looks like. Each of these squares is actually an IFU head. And so it's a little bit more filled in than it shows now, but by early next year, all of these will have IFUs in them and they will all be feeding spectrographs. And if we zoom in on one of these IFUs, each one has 448 fibers, and you can see it's not fully filled. This has a one-third fill factor. We actually do fill this in. So we do three small dithers, three six-minute dithers. That adds up to about our 20-minute observation. But we don't actually fill in the spaces between IFUs. You could if you wanted to. So if I'm going to go do a survey for galaxies, I might do that. Hetex doesn't care as much about that. And here's what it might look like on the sky if you played around with DS9. Here's our 22 arc minute field of view with that one and four and a half fill factor. And here's a zoom in on one of those you notice there's a bigger hole in the middle. That's where that extra half in the one and four and a half fill factor comes from. Other people like to do stuff with the telescope too, and so that's where their instruments go. So there's a low, uh, all the instrumentation is new, low resolution spectrograph, new high resolution spectrograph, and a new near infrared spectrograph called the Habitable Zone Planet Finder. They're all fed out of the middle there. 
Um, so the survey itself, we are doing 300 square degrees in the north in a constellation you may have heard of called Ursa Major, and 150 square degrees in the south in Sloan Stripe 82. In a minute, I'll talk to you about this blue region here where we're getting a lot of imaging and where we'll do a lot of the galaxy science. And so where we're at today, the survey began in 2017 with just 14 IFUs on the telescope. The great thing about Hetex is all the IFUs and spectrographs are in principle identical. In reality, they all have their own personalities. But in principle, they're identical, so you can start the survey even with one IFU. It's just not very efficient. So we started in 2017. Right now, we have exactly 47 out of 78 IFUs on the telescope, and we expect the full complement early next year. Um, but already, even with our half an instrument, we've completed about 10% of the survey, and we estimate we have about 300,000 emission lines currently on disk. Some of them are Lyman Alpha, some of them are Oxygen 2, some of them come from AGN, some of them are stars the software classifies as emission lines, so we're working our way through that. And we anticipate full completion of the survey in 2023. Uh, this is just uh, an image that I had an undergraduate make for an NSF proposal, which maybe you've read, if you liked it, I hope, showing you <laughs> one uh, Hetex observation here. You can collapse the IFU data cube into an image, and each circle shows you the position of a source we think is Lyman Alpha, and they just increase in redshift from the lowest one here that's really right at the end of our spectral range out to the highest redshift one here. And so this is just 20 minutes. And so when I think about what I did in my thesis, you can do this with 20 minutes. It's kind of crazy. So it's pretty exciting and depressing, but mostly exciting. Um, so science, uh, I'll go through this quickly because this is not what I do, but the goal of Hetex is to study uh, dark energy. And so in my terms, we want to understand if dark energy evolves with time or if it's a cosmological constant. Hetex will do this by measuring the Hubble parameter at a redshift of two to three to an accuracy of 1% or better, the same accuracy on the angular diameter distance, and it will also constrain the amplitude of the power spectrum. And so to put this in a bit of context, a bit of context this is a plot of accuracy of a combination of H and DA versus redshift. This is where Hetex will get uh, from its power spectrum measurement. And if you fold in intensity mapping for unresolved sources, we'll be here. So it'll be very complementary to what we'll eventually get from DESI. We'll get this pretty soon. Uh, and the techniques are a little bit different. So I'll finish by saying what I actually want to do, uh, which is non-dark energy Hetex science. And even though the dark energy stuff is fascinating, I think the number of papers that come out of Hetex from non-dark en non energy science will, at least in number, outweigh the cosmology papers. So I want to use Hetex to reduce the systematics inherent when using Lyman Alpha to trace reionization. So I'll talk all about reionization and Lyman Alpha this afternoon, but the basic story goes, if you're looking at a time in the universe that's partially neutral and partially ionized, you should see Lyman Alpha from galaxies coming from the ionized regions because it's not resonant scattering. There's no neutral gas to scatter it, and you should not see it from the neutral regions. Um, but galaxies also have gas within them, and so the ISM can have some effect. This is a nice, more graphical parameterization of what can happen to the Lyman Alpha equivalent width distribution from uh, Charlotte Mason's thesis work. So we would like to understand what is the ISM doing. To do that, we need to work at a time in the universe when the IGM is ionized, so we know the IGM is not having any effect on Lyman Alpha, and we need to work with large samples, and we need to measure their properties. And so the HETEX sample is perfect with this. This is just showing the distribution. Um, we can just look at the red curve, the full HETEX sample. And delta Z of 0.1 will have nearly 100,000 galaxies per bin. So you can study redshift evolution, for example. Uh, even in one delta Z of 0.1 bin, you can see as a function of luminosity in 0.1 dex of Lyman alpha luminosity bins, we'll have thousands, hundreds, to tens of thousands. To actually do anything with this, you need to understand what the properties are of the galaxy. And so you could do that in a variety of ways. And one of the ways we plan to do this with the largest sample is in this blue region here called SHELA. This is the final acronym, Spitzer Hetex Exploratory Large Area Survey. It's a new legacy field on the sky. It's about 20 square degrees in area. And we have imaging in the optical from the dark energy camera and uh, the near infrared from New Firm. This was an NOAO survey proposal I led and also from Spitzer IRAC. And so we can use all of this photometry to try and measure the properties of these galaxies and correlate that with Lyman Alpha emission. I did it really, 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 really poorly, just to have a plot to show you. Don't remember this plot at all, but take it away as the type of analyses we can do, measure things like stellar mass, specific star formation rate, dust attenuation, plot it versus Lyman Alpha line strength the equivalent width, and look for interesting correlations. And then the ultimate goal is to identify which combination of properties maximize the escape of Lyman Alpha emission, and then go back and use only those type of galaxies in the epoch of reionization. And I think that's it. Thank you. This is really impressive uh, for the price of coffee per galaxy. You get in so much information. Obviously, you don't want to just reduce it to one number, which is the Hubble constant you might want to find much more, much richer astrophysics. Mm -hmm. So, you yeah, have a question about the, um, 
the, if that slide you had with all of the Lyman alpha spectrum, yeah. do you have other lines in there which will help you identify, or is this a one-line identification? It's a one-line, and that's the challenge. So um, if it's <coughs> Lyman alpha or oxygen 2, you'll see one line. Uh, there are some weird AGM lines that maybe see one line, but if it uh, can't be H alpha, so we're too blue, but if it's oxygen 3 uh, or H beta or some of those other lines, you would always get two. So if you get one, you know it's either Lyman alpha or oxygen 2. If the resolution of the survey was double what it was, you would actually split O2, and that would solve that problem, but it's not. And so we have a Bayesian uh, modeling code that takes into account the equivalent width, uh, the color of the galaxy, if you can find it in the continuum image, to try and split Lyman alpha from O2. Uh, so we don't have to be perfect. The, the threshold is about a 2% contamination that dark energy measurement can handle before we start to lose our accuracy and get bad cross-redshift correlations. But you can probably use also the size of the gut, the angular size, no? You could, um, certainly not in this data because the seeing at that facility is not great. Actually, the fibers are one and a half arc second. Um, and in the imaging, if you have Hubble, absolutely. If you don't have Hubble, some galaxies are really big because they're nearby, but there are compact O2 emitting galaxies at redshift 0.2 or 0.3. And so certainly if it's resolved, then yes, that can go into the, the Bayesian code and use that to rule it out. But being unresolved does not mean that it's high redshift. Mm -hmm. yeah. With the sample you collect, I would think that you could also set constraints on inflation models. Um, <coughs> is, is it competitive with uh, uh, other inflation, uh, you know, large area surveys? Yeah, that's an that? excellent question I do not have an answer for. But um, yeah, I can certainly ask. I, I, I've heard a lot of talks on the cosmology, I don't remember all of it, but there are a lot more we'll be doing than H and DA. We can constrain the number of neutrino species, the growth of structure, and measure lots of stuff. Last question. Yeah, so so we've talked about this. Um, so not much, but it can have an effect. Um, and I've talked to Ichiro Komatsu, who will be leading a lot of the cosmology effort, and what he really wants is he wants to know the distribution of Lyman alpha velocity offsets. And so we had for a long time KMOS data to do that, but HETEX took long enough to happen that um, most of this was KMOS GTO data from Mel Thunderstein. Most of that time has been used. And so we will want to do some follow-up work with KMOS or MOSFI or something to measure a systemic line like oxygen 3 or H-alpha and really build up the distribution of that velocity offset. And really, I think that velocity offset as a function of Lyman alpha flux or equivalent. Well, let's thank uh, Steve again. <laughs>
what are their molecular abundances going beyond just Fe over H or alpha elements? Um, if we can measure a, a brown dwarf orbiting a star, how might we expect the abundances in the, in the stellar atmosphere and the brown dwarf atmosphere uh, to compare? Does that tell us something about how it fragmented or whether it sort of forms in a weird way like a planet? Um, so that's something we can test. Um, and then because we're dealing with molecules, molecules have a lot more mm, chemistry happening on them. So what kind of chemical trends can we identify within a uh, brown dwarf, say, as a function of temperature and gravity? And what can this um, you know, tell us about the, the chemical processes happening in the atmosphere? And can we use that to kind of um, learn something about their uh, irradiated counterparts, planets? Okay. And so just kind of to drive home that, we, we have spectra, lots of spectra of brown dwarfs that are of similar quality um, and wavelength coverage and fidelity as, um, as, as stars. Uh, so the key thing here is that, that they're cooler, right? So these are cooler, and so most of the flux is coming out uh, in the near-infrared compared to the optical, unlike, um, uh, unlike a star. And so as you go through the different spectral sequence, um, right, so Ms are kind of the latest type uh, star that you can have. Then you have these Ls, Ts, and then eventually Ys are how the, um, how the different uh, subtypes within the brown dwarfs are broken up. And these different spe spectral classifications are broken up into, in terms of the, the presence of certain molecular bands that eventually show up. So when you have these kind of cooler, maybe eight, 700 K T dwarf objects, you're really dominated by methane and water absorption in their atmospheres. Whereas if you have these hotter, earlier type uh, L dwarfs, you're really dominated by uh, things like TIO and, and VO and, and some CO and maybe, um, and also some water as well. So there's a lot of kind of molecular diversity happening in a brown dwarf's uh, atmosphere. And so um, if you take the sort of stellar, uh, the classic stellar uh, approach of, you know, taking some sort of um, model like an, uh, an atlas model or a phoenix model, um, you can use that to do stellar abundance analyses. You can match these templates to uh, the observed spectrum. But when you do that for brown dwarfs, when you take these models that, that throw in all of this physics, like radiative convective equilibrium, um, and you take into account the chemistry, these models uh, oftentimes fail miserably uh, in terms of matching the uh, actual data. So that's telling us that there's some physics missing in these models. And so um, I stole a technique from uh, the exoplanet community who stole a technique from the planetary science community uh, and applied this technique called atmospheric retrieval to brown dwarf uh, spectra. So basically the idea is you just add more free parameters, but the idea is that you assume that uh, we don't um, fully understand um, in, in the self-consistent uh, substellar models, all of the physics and chemistry that's happening. So let's just fit for those components. Let's just retrieve the molecular abundances and, and the thermal structure in the atmosphere. And so this um, seizure inducing figure down here is, is sort of a kind of illustrating uh, what's going on. And so basically we try and extract from these spectra, these, these rich molecular features showing up, what those molecular abundances are and how the thermal structure evolves with, with altitude in the atmosphere. And so we can ask questions like, what is the water to CO ratio? What is the methane to CO ratio? And things like that. And does the temperature um, look like you would expect, assuming standard radiative convective equilibrium? So we can answer these questions um, using this technique. Um, and so you can get out all sorts of um, interesting, you know, within this Bayesian framework, you can pull out kind of the uncertainty distributions on these molecules. I know I'm cheating a little bit for those of you guys who saw my talk earlier, but this is a different application. Um, and so we can ask these questions, you know, what molecules exist, what are their abundances, um, and, and what are the range of thermal structures uh, in, in these atmospheres. So you say, well, how do you know that this uh, technique actually works? Uh, and so we use what are called benchmark objects. So benchmark objects are objects that um, there's a star and a brown dwarf, and presumably um, we're pretty good by now at doing stellar abundance analyses. And so we can actually extract the, uh, the metallicities and the carbon to oxygen ratios uh, in the whole stars, which are kind of these uh, um, uh, G and K, or sorry, K type stars here. So we can do stellar abundance analyses on these stars, and then we can compare the abundances uh, of, of the elements that we get in the stars to those of the brown dwarfs. We would assume that they should have the same intrinsic elemental abundance uh, inventory. We also have crude estimates uh, for the ages of the stars, and so we can um, use um, the uh, effective temperature and gravity that we pull out from the brown dwarf spectra and, and compare those to the evolutionary tracks of these, uh, of these substellar objects to see if those um, ages are consistent, okay? And so when we do that, um, we, well, we can effectively um, 
you know, back out the water abundance, methane abundance, all this stuff, we can convert that into a metallicity and we can compare that um, to what we would get from the star um, itself. So these uh, kind of red hashed curves right here represent the stellar abundances that are extracted um, and then the kind of histograms in the sort of kind of 2D histogram blob right here is representative of the metallicity and the carbon to oxygen ratio that we derive using um, using the, the molecules that we, we pull out, the, mo the molecular abundances that we pull out um, of the spectra. So one weird thing that you have to worry about uh, in brown dwarfs um, that you don't have to worry about in stars is the formation of dust or clouds. Um, and so what ends up happening is you can form these, these silicate clouds, rock clouds, so en enstatite and forstrite and weird things like that, where they can actually suck up oxygen so you don't see it. So uh, a lot of these brown dwarfs, um, if you just look at their water abundance, might have a slightly enhanced um, uh, uh, sorry, slightly depleted water abundance than you would you would expect otherwise because you're you're losing some of this oxygen in these in these weird rock clouds, and so more or less uh, we get results that are consistent with what you would expect for the star. So we say let's go ahead and apply this analysis on a handful of other objects. So there's brilliant ground dwarf libraries um, on the internet that you can go get uh, ground based data from, and then there's also been a bunch of uh, HST uh, uh, data obtained of some of the coolest. Uh, brown dwarf objects. And so what we wanted to do is a sort of a uniform analysis. This is sort of a project I've been working on for the past few years is looking at uh, brown dwarfs over kind of a, a range of, of temperatures and kind of building up a sample, a statistical sample of abundances um, and temperature structures and things like that. So we can start to address, you know, what's going on with brown dwarfs, their atmospheres as, as, a, as a population. So this is some um, work that I started and that now is being uh, taken over by uh, one of my uh, uh, grad students. And so just for those of you who are color magnitude inclined, um, this is kind of a weird color magnitude space right here. So H band magnitude and, and J minus K. So normal stars are kind of in this gray region up here. And so a lot of the work that I've done here focuses on these, these T and Y dwarfs, which are, are mostly dust free. They don't really have a lot of these clouds, uh, which can kind of confuse our interpretation of the, of the presence of, of certain molecules. Um, so again, most of the sample is coming from this kind of region of the color magnitude diagram, the brown dwarf color magnitude diagram. And so, okay, what can we do with this? Well, we can diagnose trends in chemistry. It's kind of all over the place right now. Um, we really can't say too much about what we would, um, in terms of the water abundances, we would expect them to more or less be uh, constant with decreasing uh, uh, effective temperature, but there could be variance in uh, the intrinsic uh, carbon to oxygen ratio or metallicity within the brown dwarf population. Um, one of the more exciting trends, trends that we can find is the fact that um, uh, all, these are all upper limits right here. That's why they're not really showing very much. But as you uh, decrease in temperature, we find that uh, the alkali metals in the atmosphere become depleted as you get towards cooler temperatures because that sodium and potassium, those are getting locked up into other weird clouds, these salt clouds, Na2S and, and KCl. And so we can start to kind of pick off this trend here and can compare that to, say, maybe another prediction that would describe how clouds um, actually form. And perhaps more importantly, is we can actually start to put uh, brown dwarf uh, abundances on an equal footing as normal stars, FGK stars. So this is kind of the distribution of the F FGK star, CDO ratios and metallicities. How does the brown dwarf population compare to that? And why do you want to care about the metallicities of, of stars and the CDO ratios of stars? Well, it's because that helps provide context for the planets that are orbiting them. Um, are there planets orbiting brown dwarfs? Maybe. Um, but anyway, just from a kind of galactic chemical evolution point of view, understanding the abundances of all objects, stellar and substellar, um, uh, is, is ultimately important. So um, we're, we're doing this now, and we're hoping to add many more um, objects to this as we continue to play. That's it. Mike, uh, why don't we know the planets around those? They're faint. And they have molecules, and that's hard for radio velocity stuff. Okay. Yeah. Charles? So I have a very basic question. Um, is there uh, something like local chemical equilibrium in these models so that you can calculate for a given set of elemental abundances what the chemical abundances are? Yes, that's what the, the original models that, that didn't fit any of the spectra do. <laughs> Why is it not in local chemical equilibrium? Um, well, so as you get towards cooler temperatures, these other mechanisms like vertical mixing, the time scale to mix blobs of air is actually faster than the time scale it takes for two molecules to reach, you know, to reach chemical equilibrium. So that's that's one effect. 
Um, another effect could be um, subtle changes in the shape of the, 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 thermal, the thermal structure. Um, it's been hypothesized, does that need to be in, in radiative convective equilibrium? Uh, but that you could have these other effects um, called double diffusive convection that can change the shape of the, of the temperature profile in the atmosphere. So there's a bunch of things that these, these models that make these assumptions that you would expect are standard may not be so standard. Well, we need to move on because uh, we are running out of time. Uh, let's thank Mike again. Okay, so let's come back to dust. <laughs> yeah, so uh, today I'm going to talk about dust. And as an astronomer, I love dust because the dust emission and absorption is very powerful for us to study the universe. But as a human being, I hate dust. <laughs> and in, especially in winter in South Korea, there is a couple of days. The dust, the fire dust, is really a severe problem. And the government decided to, uh, to consider dust as a natural disaster. <laughs> and in Vietnam, where I grew up, dust pollution is even worse because people are using bikes, motorbikes, for commute. So I was always wondering how to destroy dust. <laughs> and previous research showed that we can destroy dust using thermal sublimation, thermal sputtering, or grain shattering. But all these three mechanisms seem to have a limited application in some, only some limited environments. And today I'm going to introduce a new mechanism that can destroy dust in more universal environments. So the mechanism is based on very uh, popular force, centrifugal force. And centrifugal force is actually pseudo force, but you can create or change centrifugal force easily. Okay, I can show you one example. <laughs> so this is a ball and the string. Yeah, so I can create the centrifugal force, right? And I can increase the force. So what happens when I can spin extremely fast? What will happen to the ball? So the ball will be ejected, right? And this is the idea of our mechanism. OK, so in astrophysical environments, dust grains tend to be irregular, and they have irregular shapes. So dust grains are located near some strong radiation source, like a massive star supernovae. And they can be spun up to extremely fast rotation. The rotation rate can exceed 1 billion rows per second. And with such a rotation rate, no any material can survive against the centrifugal force, even diamond. And the dust grains is disrupted into many fragments. And these mechanisms seem to be very uh, useful, very powerful. OK, so the central idea of this mechanism is the spin up. So if you don't know how to spin up, you can ask your children. <laughs> okay, so you don't have to spin up the pinwheel, you just blow it, so making an airflow. In, in our case, I brought this idea for radiative torques. So basically, I just replace the pinwheel with an helical grain and the gas flow with the radiation beam. So the radiation consists of many photons, so when photons are reflected from the mirror, they create radiation force, and because the force is acting at some distance from the center of mass. It creates radiative torque. And this torque can spin up the dust grain. And within model, we can calculate radiative torque. It depends on the photon momentum, the flux of photon, the cross-section of grain, and with some coefficient here. And if you have a strong radiation field, larger radiation intensity, you have a larger radiative torque. Larger grains experience larger radiative torques. And this model has been tested in the experiment. So in 2004, Abbas et al., they conducted the experiment test in order to test the spin up by radio talk. So they placed a dust grain in the vacuum chamber. So they use a laser source to spin up the dust grain. The green laser source here is used to measure the rotation rate with a video camera. And they found that the rotation rate increased with the radiation intensity as we predicted. 
I'm here. So for the uh, radiation intensity, the rotation rate is 10,000 rau, uh, 10, rau per second. So if we can increase the radiation intensity to very large, the rotation rate is significantly increased. So dust grains, if they are located near a radiation source, like a supernovae, massive star, with very huge luminosity, so they can be spun up to very fast rotation rate, as you can see here. So here we show the rotation rate spun up by ray radiative torques from a supernovae as a function of times. So you can see that within 20 days, the dust grains already spun up to more than 10 million, uh, 1 million rows per second. And we compare this rotation rate with the maximum limit that the dust grain material can survive against the centrifugal force. So S marks here is a maximum tensile strength of material. And the maximum limit is just about 400 million rows per second. So dust grains are disrupted. So larger grains experience larger radiative torques. So they are easily disrupted. Small grains, they experience lower radiative torques, and they have a larger critical disruption rate. So small grains are not disrupted. So we predict the disruption of dust grains around a, super, uh, a supernovae. So dust grains here are some distance from the supernovae. For composite grain with lower tensile strength and compact grains with very high tensile strength. So even at uh, several parsecs from the supernovae, large dust grains with composite structures can be disrupted. And near the radiation source, compact grains can also be disrupted. So we uh, use the results to predict the distribution of dust grains surrounding a supernovae or a massive star. So basically, far away from the source, large grains cannot be disrupted. But near the source, large grains are disrupted. So we have a distribution of the uh, abundance of dust grains. Basically, the abundance of small grains increase toward the central radiation source. OK, so the theory is based on tested physics. And it have a, has a prediction. Now, how we can test? Well, in order to prove our th uh, theory, we need to address the issue raised by Richard Feynman. If the theory is even beautiful, it doesn't agree with experiment. It's wrong. Well, fortunately, we already have uh, evidence from reality. So in 1909, there is an explosion of centrifuge at MIT lab. You can see here, because the centrifuge is was spinning very fast, and it is disrupted. Because in order to be relevant for astrophysical condition, we have to convince you that we have an observational evidence. OK, so we test our theory with supernovae and massive stars. So type 1a supernovae have been the standard candles to study cosmological constant. But it's also a powerful tool to study the dust properties in the local environments. And for many high reddening supernovae, People found that dust have a very unusual properties. So for the typical dust properties in our galaxy, the RV parameter, the total to selective extinction is about 3.1. Because RV here characterize the mean grain size. And for the our galaxy is 3.1. But for many supernovae, the RV is about 1.7. It's much, much smaller than the standard value. So the mean grain size is much smaller, about. 0 0.05 micro, smaller than about 0.1 micro. So this is exactly consistent with our prediction, right? Now, let's consider another case of the H2 region surrounding massive star. H2 region is very hot, so we expect that dust grains are destroyed, especially small grains are destroyed by thermal sputtering. However, as you can see here in the Bible, in the central region here, large grains emission is quite low. But the emission at uh, median threat, 20 micron, is very strong. That's the indication of the uh, existence of very small grains near the central region or near the source. Now, another case is the young massive cluster. It has H2 region here. And there exists some emission excess from 1 to 5 micron, as you can see here. It cannot be explained by the standard dust model. And this is at one to five microns, so it must be produced by very hot and small dust grains that have a low capacity. And 
uh, in addition, the abundance of very small grains tend to increase towards the central uh, region. And this is consistent with our prediction. So large grains are disrupted into small grains, and then they can reproduce the strand. Okay, so now, so our theory has observational evidence. Let's bring our theory to a next level. So one of the important questions for astrochemistry is the uh, observation of cost, uh, complex organic molecules. We know that combs are formed on the ice mantle of dust grains, but we don't know how combs are released from the ice mantle. So there are many uh, theories, but the major mechanism to evaporate or to release ice mantle, uh, compounds from ice mantle is thermal sublimation. So basically the ice mantle here is heated by radiation from junk star to above the sublimation limit, above 100 Kelvin. But we know that there are some observations show that the combs are detected at lower temperature environments, less than 100 Kelvin. We don't know how to explain that. So now I give you some uh, uh, idea. So this is a big ice. If somehow I can break this ice into smaller fragments, so what do you think? The sublimation rate should increase because first the total surface area is increased, right? But another more subtle effect is because if the fragments are very small, tiny, single photon can transient heat the fragment to very high temperature, and it induces transient heating and transient evaporation. So this is our mechanism. So the ice mantle on the core grain is spun up by radiation from young star to extremely fast rotation, more than 10 billion rounds per second. So the ice mantle now is disrupted into many small fragments. We don't know what is the side distribution of fragments, but we know that maybe some fraction of fragments is less than one 10 nanometer. And even once UV photons can hit this fragment to very high temperature. For other smaller fragments, the sublimation rate is also increased significantly more than 10,000 times, as we show in this paper. Okay, so with that, we discovered a new mechanism, namely rotational disruption by radiative torques. So the mechanism can be applied to many environments with the generation field. And we show that the mechanism can work even with our average interstellar radiation field. And with this mechanism, we can explain many long-lasting puzzles in natural physics. For example, what, is, what physics determines the maximum cutoff here? We explain that because large grains are disrupted by radiative torques, so no more large grains are here. And we also explain why the extinction curve towards many strong radiation sources, like a quasar, gamma ray burst, have a very steep far UV rise here. And also the effect of dust extension for Lyman alpha escape fraction. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. I think an obvious application would be around AGN in the central part. Is there any evidence that the dust grains are smaller close to AGN? Oh yeah, actually that is a very interesting question. For well, the dust properties around AGN, now there are two popular uh, <laughs> results. So some, some results show that the dust around AGN have a larger size. But some studies show that the dust <coughs> has small size. So, uh, but, but one thing here is, is for the existence of the large grains around AGN, and people found that such grains tend to be called graphite. And such a field graphite can be very strong, and then they are uh, disrupted less efficiently than um, silicate grids. Yeah. yeah, so you said the radiation pressure can break grains from spinning them up. Uh, radiation so, radiation so talks, so so radiation, pressure. <laughs> right, but there's also an outward acceleration, right? Oh, the acceleration, yes. Yeah, the acceleration so. is also important, but the extent <laughs> for the actual acceleration is, is closer to the source. The, 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 like for the case of supernovae, the disruption can happen at several percent. But the radiation pressure at that distance uh, can only accelerate to like 100 kilometers per second. So the, the time scale is quite small. Yeah, it's quite sub, I think. Yeah. It's sub, I think. Uh, yeah. Just to 
ice-covered grains exist predominantly in well-shielded regions, where there isn't a lot yeah. of uh, uh, irradiation. Uh, so uh, can you spin these grains up sufficiently? And oh, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we study in details the resorption of dust grains in the hot cores uh, around massive stars. So that is very high density. The density is like more than one uh, million uh, atom per cubic centimeter. But they are exposed to the, uh, the central star, so they can be uh, disrupted. Okay, um, we are, we have, uh, I have two announcements. One, we, at two o'clock we have a special celebration. It's called uh, uh, Quito de Mayo. <laughs> that, uh, we will have a two and, and also provide the Quito Award to the two recipients that we heard from. Uh, and the second, I wanted to wish everyone a very productive and enjoyable summer. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>